Previously, we have discussed how H of n is the unit pulse or impulse response of a system. We have also discussed the Z transform and how to compute the output of a system using convolution. In this lecture, we combine these concepts to describe how we can find the impulse response of a system using the inverse Z transform. If we are given a filter, we can easily find the difference equation that describes the filter. If we want to find the impulse response of the filter, we can plug the delta function into the equation. With the equation in this form, we can either do the laborious route of trying to calculate the h of n directly, or we can take the z transform of the difference equation to find h of z. We call h of z the transfer function of the filter. We calculate h of z for four reasons. First, it allows us to find a compact expression for the impulse response quickly. Second, it enables us to create dif different filter structures that have the same transfer function. Third, it allows us to easily combine filters together. And fourth, it allows us to determine if the system is stable. So the first reason, if we have h of z, we can find h of n by taking the inverse z transform of h of z. Simple enough. For the second reason, if we have a transfer function written like h of z, we can construct an infinite number of filters that implement the same transfer function. For example, the filter above implements the same transfer function as the previous filter. As you notice, the design is radically different, and we'll later discover that we can create different styles of filters to balance trade-offs between computation time and error caused by the finite register lengths as well as the finite time we want to calculate things. And third, if we combine two filters in series, we can simply multiply their transfer functions together to find the transfer function of the whole system. Also, if we combine two filters in parallel, we can simply add their transfer functions together. The fourth reason we use h of z is perhaps the most important reason. If we know h of z, we can determine if a bounded input into the filter will yield a bounded output. If an input is bounded, we mean that the sequence x of n never has a magnitude greater than alpha for all n, where alpha is less than infinity. Similarly, if an output is bounded, we mean that sequence y of n never has a magnitude greater than beta for all n. If a bounded input always yields a bounded output for h of n, then the system is called Bebo stable. So if we're looking at the function h of n, a system will be Bebo stable if the summation of the magnitude of the impulse response is bounded. In other words, the magnitude of the h of n must not grow without bounds. We can ensure that the magnitude of h of n does not grow without bounds if the ROC includes the unit circle, where the unit circle is a circle with radius 1 in the z-plane. So that means that all right-sided poles must be less than magnitude 1, and all left-sided poles must be greater than 1. If the system is causal, like most of our systems will be, all poles in the system must be inside the unit circle. To finish this lecture, let's discuss what happens if we have a causal system with a pole on the unit circle. With this system, the impulse response function will equal the unit step. If we put most any bounded input into the system, we will have a bounded output. However, if we make x of n the unit st step function as well, so that it's equal to the impulse response, the system output will be a linearly increasing function and will grow without bound. We call these types of systems 
um, nearly stable. Um, but in general, we'll just simply refer to these as unstable systems, although they can be used in most situations.